You made it. Here. Finally. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of that place you've always wanted to go. You know the one. It's nice. Even the kids like it. This place is so cool. And they never like it. Mom, can we go to the pool? Look at that. Not even asking for the Wi-Fi. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, comedian Bruce Baum talks about that game show scandal. So we get on the show, and at the end of Super Password, you if you're the winner, you can pick one of the celebrities to go to the final round. So he picks me. Well, the guy that I did the show with, people recognized him. He was a wanted felon. So all day long, they're showing pictures of me and this guy saying felon on Super Password News at 5. They don't say who's the felon. Today on the show, comedian Bruce Baum talks about a game show scandal. Stay close. Hey, my name is Bruce Baum, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show of over 11 years, or you're a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the show last week with television writer Claudia Lano. Do you know Claudia, Bruce? I know her parents, Mark oh, Lano yeah. and Joanne Astro. Right. I, I, we were talking about, um, I took comedy classes. I took stand up from Mark, her, her dad, which is kind of cool. And, uh, she's an amazing talent, very well spoken and a terrific writer. She talked about. <laughs> and then I forget her story. That's terrible. I've been recording a lot this week, actually. So let me alone. Uh, no, she <laughs> talked about. <laughs> Make it up. You're talking to the people no. that didn't see it yet. Go ahead and I, make it up. I'm not going to make it up, man. Right. Why would I do that? That can't, I'm not like get that. There. No, I can get there. Oh, I know. Worst Christmas ever. And it was damn funny. Worst Christmas ever with Claudia Lano. So go back, you guys. Listen to that episode. You're really going to be glad you did. But not today. Not today. Because now I'm here with comedian Bruce Baum. And I have, I feel like in a way I almost grew up with you, Bruce. Gosh. Well, I mean, you're, you've been doing comedy for so long and with so many incredible people. And, you know, it's like you were very active in the 70s with people like George Carlin and even Robin Williams and all these, you know, really mega stars. And, you know, you've done so many game shows. And as you know, I have a game show. You know that, right? I have a game yes, show. Yes, yes. Right. Story Smash. And so your <laughs> your wealth of game shows completely impresses me. And it makes me laugh because I have a great I have so many questions. <laughs> you've been on so many shows. Just name off some of the game shows you've been on. Uh, let's see. Hollywood Squares Match Game, Super Password, Yahtzee, uh, Make Me Laugh, which is really the very first one, which I may talk about later, but that was the catalyst, if I may be mm. so bold, I'm going to be, uh, for the comedy boom. That and the comedy oh, wow. store. were How interesting. Yeah. Well, and the evening at the improv, don't you think? No. Oh, okay. I mean, it, it right. was pivotal. It was pivotal, sure. but it came along after the boom. It kind of after rode the, the boom. The boom was starting. We can talk about that shortly later. Well, if you let wish. me ask you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you, Bruce. Uh, that game show make me laugh. The premise was that. You know, just tell me the premise. I know okay. basically a comedian tries to make you laugh. I well, get a that. A, a contestant would come out, okay? Uh -huh. And they would have three comedians, one by one, have 60 seconds each to make the contestant laugh. If they lasted, if they got a dollar for each second that they lasted, and okay. if they lasted all three minutes, they doubled that. So it was like three hundred and sixty dollars, mm -hmm. and there'd always be one celebrity. We had Frank Zappa was on an episode, and Lynn Swan, and they were from all over the place. But you would come out, and you would have 
th- three minutes to make the comedian to make the contestant laugh. And uh, that started, you know, I it was at the comedy store. I got there in about 75 and and with Robin Williams. And I, I was there. I was there the week Robin already. I met Robin the same week I met my wife in San Diego. Mitzi Short called and said, there's a guy moving down from San, Di- from San Francisco that's going to audition next week. Do you mind if he comes in and does some guest sets in San Diego? So he came down and just killed. And wow. And that's audition- at the La Jolla Comedy Store. Back then it was actually in San Diego. It was in a different room called T.D. Hayes, hmm. which was in San Diego on the beach. Uh, that's how long ago it was. This had to be wow. 76, 77. Amazing. And then he auditioned the next Monday. And it was the same week I met my wife. So, and then he, uh, auditioned the next Monday night at the comedy store and just took off. Yeah. Wow. So, that's exciting. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. That's but, really But what exciting. happened was make me laugh would come into the comedy store and pluck the guys out of there. So we would, you know, it's Saget, Shandling, myself, Kipadada, Howie Mandel, and wow. I'm probably m- l- missing a few that I, but uh, we could plug the gigs we were doing. And these first couple of clubs that opened up like in Detroit and Cleveland, we could plug those days. And unlike when you did the Tonight Show or Merv Griffin, if someone missed you, they had to wait a couple months to see you again. If they went to work and said, man, did you see the guy last night on, on the Tonight? No. Well, he'll be on in a couple of months. Well, Make me yeah. laugh. It was he's on again tonight. So oh, by wow. the end of the week, you had a big audience. And so these clubs started booking us. Detroit was first and then Cleveland. And we just kept going back like every eight or nine weeks, which made you have to write more material, but got you more ready for more make me laughs. And they were just using and and everything exploded from there. So, so were you were doing... Pl- yeah, so you were the comedian on the show. You were one of the comics, right? Right. And they were plucking most of the guys excuse me, out of the comedy store. Yeah. So, yes, a, a typical episode would be myself, Franklin Ajay, and maybe Steve Bluestein. And so, yeah, so the the where did the stars come in that were playing? Were the, they the people you were trying to make laugh? Or who was – you were trying There's, to make contestants, like regular people laugh? Right. They would be pulled out from the audience. They'd kind of be right. looking at people in the crowd – and seeing who looked like they were jovial Mm -hmm. and being in the crowd got them involved, not knowing if they were going to be called like, uh, boy, how am I not going to laugh? If I get called, how am I not going to laugh at that guy? Right. So uh, that's how they, they did that. Uh, So, so they were like trapped in the middle of a comedy maelstrom, if you will. Will you? Cause I I just did. So there weren't any judges (laughs) or anything or who was the host? No. Well, they judged whether it was a laugh or not, like if a little bit of tooth showed. I Bobby <laughs> Van was the host and the last person out would be the celebrity. So I the last, see. and they were playing for somebody. I forget whether it was the audience or at home. That's what I was trying to figure out. Well, that does sound very funny to tell the tr- to tell you the truth. And I know that my game show story smash is sort of in that vein as of in that there's no production value, very little, you know, you're just talking about microphones and people, you right. know, that are smart and quick witted and the writing kind of pretty much writes itself. So I love that kind of stuff because of course, comedians, obviously, you know, they know brevity, they know how to get to the joke. And that's why they always have comedians on game shows, you know, playing the parts. Obviously, even now, like one of my favorite ones to watch is to tell the truth. With Anthony Anderson. Right. And, you know, of course, they have on Nikki Glaser and they have on, you know, all the comics. And it makes sense because they're going to get the best result. So today you bring forth the topic, game show scandal. So I'm so excited to hear this story. But let me ask you a few questions. Oh, by the way, I don't think there could be really a scandal in my show, Story Smash, unless, unless the scandal was like, choosing the audience member like if i could rig that somehow i don't personally touch like we have a bucket and people put their names in and somebody gets pulled out and i don't even touch it i let that go with like my guy that helps me out and one of my judges is the one that draws the name because i don't want to have anything to do with that in terms of somebody thinking i cheated you know right well your scandal could happen live on stage yeah no i know (laughs) but i'm trying to think of what the scandal could be like there's no real scandal. I mean, unless the judges are partial to somebody, but they could be that anyway. Right. 
Anyway, I think it's interesting. And I do remember like the big lottery scandal that happened. That was a big deal in, was that the late seventies? God, I think so. I'm those, the decades mushed together. Yeah, but it was in Pittsburgh. I think, I think it was even where I'm from in Pittsburgh and like this guy, they were weighting the balls, you know, that were be popping up oh. and down like ping pong and they weighted the ball. They wanted to, you know, Drop. come come out yeah and it was a huge deal wow. so i know game show scandals exist and we're going to talk about <laughs> yours today but i also want to ask you have you were you always a prop comic or how did that start and where are you now with that well i i, I started out as a singer songwriter uh oddly enough no and i didn't back, know that yeah back in like the 70s you were david crosby well, I tried to be that. <laughs> I wrote my own stuff, and I would sing Van Morrison and Neil Young and then my own stuff. And I would, you know, back then they had, to tell you how long ago it was, or to illustrate how long ago it was, the Troubadour on Monday nights used to have a hootenanny night. So it was when they used the word hootenanny. That's how long ago it was. Wow, that's funny. And, and the first three people in line got to go on, and then their regular amateurs went on. So I got there at like six in the morning in my sleeping bag to make sure I was one of the first three. Sure, sure, Nobody sure. else showed up till three in the afternoon. Oh, so God. there I am sleeping on Santa Monica Boulevard in my sleeping bag. Um, so I started doing that. Then one night I was at a, a, a little club in the San Fernando Valley. It was in a place called the Whole Earth Marketplace or called the Good Food Cafe, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was performing. There was maybe eight people in the crowd. And while I'm performing... Two dogs walk in, and this is a true story, and they start getting it on right in front of me. <laughs> All right? And I mean full on where they got tied and everything. And the audience just went silent. I stopped playing, and I said, this really pisses me off because they know they're not on until after the juggler. <laughs> And, and they, that got a laugh. And I went, wow, that was easier than getting this every three minutes. So I started doing more comedy. And then when I, uh, I was playing football at UCLA as a freshman, I transferred up to Davis with my cousin to play football. But the first day up there, we started doing things like running into the library. He would strum his banjo. I would blow a horn or play my guitar. Everybody would stop. And we would do like two or there were no clubs. So we would do two or three minutes of stand up. And this is 72 to 74. And then we would do two or three minutes of stand up in the library and then run away. And then <laughs> we would write a letter to the paper the next day. We were in the library yesterday. Couldn't get anything done there because there's two guys making everybody laugh. Then the day after that, we would write a letter from the student health center saying we're having a rash of something we've never had before. People are coming in with broken cheeks. And the only common denominator is they were in the library yesterday laughing. Oh so it was gosh. pretty much guerrilla comedy. And then a few bars started hiring us and we would come in. I don't know how we did it, but we would do four 45 minute sets. Wow. But it would be music and comedy, a lot of mugging and winking. And we would get like 20 bucks that would split, which was a lot. I mean, you could go on a date that week. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So um, and then when we came down to L.A., we worked out in a little club in the San Fernando Valley. And then we, our first gig was before the ice house was an all comedy club. It would have singers and they would sometimes have a comic be the middle or opener. Sure. So we got hired to open for Scatman Crothers. Wow. Uh, yeah. So wow, that's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. And George Miller happened to pop in one night, see us and go, why aren't you guys playing the comedy store? And we went, well, I, you know, so he set up an audition with Mitzi. I think it was the same night Letterman did his. Wow. And we both got, we were both, I was part of a team, Bomb and Eston then. And we both got, uh, became regulars right you off got the bat. picked up. Oh my right gosh. Away. That was fantastic. Yeah, and so, that was as a duo. Right. And then we split in 78. He went on to write. And by the way, his name was Ken Eston. He's my first cousin. And he went on to write for Cheers and Taxi and won an Emmy. Wow. wow. But he wasn't that much into performing. And that's kind of so I went solo. And yeah, I was heavily props. I mean, if people don't know me by my voice, I did a character called Baby Man years ago. Mm -hmm. You might remember that. 
but uh, but I used I would travel. It was like ZZ Top was traveling with their trains. I had cases of stuff and I whittled it down because as I went around the country and started writing more stand up and getting just as big laughs with stand up as props. And a lot of these places had a different sound guy every night. And I can deal with mess ups, but I just heard it's easier. Let me just whittle it down. So, yes, I use a few props now, but I do a lot of stand up. That's just as crazy as the prop stuff. Yeah, sure. It's funny how you equated the laughter with um, the music. In other words, it doesn't sound like you were that music was that hardcore in your heart if you gave it up like that for a laugh. Well, but I still am into music. I've, yeah, uh, yeah, you didn't give it I up. A, you... But I've also had a couple little novelty hits. Uh, I know people remember Marty Feldman Eyes, which is a spoof <laughs> of Betty Davis Eyes. <laughs> I've got a video on uh, Don't You Wish Your Boyfriend Was Bald Like Me. Uh, That's funny. And, yeah, no, definitely you've kept the music, but it's and funny. I had that... a band, by the way, called Noggin Blast, and we were playing around town. I had the uh, sax player from Pink Floyd, the wow. drummer from Ambrosia. And we were playing the Canyon Club. And and uh, so, yeah, I, I've all you know, what I find is comics are frustrated, want to be musicians and musicians are frustrated, want to be comedians. I totally so that's why agree. They get along. They get along real well together. Comedy and music are very, very uh, well connected, which leads me to my new podcast, which I'm not going to talk about because it's not I got to figure out a way to get around the music licensing or get on (laughs) with somebody who has music licensing. But it is about comedy and music and how similar they are and how many comics really do want to be rock stars. You know, it's a very solo path, you know, whether you're the comedian or the musician i mean musicians can be with a band of course that's different but still in your heart it's like you and your instrument and do you want to write or don't you want to write you know it's either going to do it or you're not it's a craft you can take into your own hands i like an art i guess it's an art it's another art now you mentioned noggin blast you do (laughs) you do have another website called nogginblast.com and that is where you make your own what it's hot sauce. Hot uh, sauce. It's, it's organic. I use ghost peppers, habaneros. Uh, I grow them all myself. Like right now, we just sold out of uh, ghost pepper, blueberry lime, and, wow. and, and serrano cherry. Oh, uh, my gosh. But you can go on there and put your name on the uh, email list. You'll always be the first to have an opportunity. But there, it's all I grow the, or, uh, the peppers organically, organic soil. And each plant is in its own grow bag. So, How neat. And everything else is certified organic. I can't afford to have it certified. So I'm letting you know it's grown organically. Everything else is organic, organically certified. And so what exactly, you know, these peppers, what, how do you, how, how did you come to this? I mean, you knew you could just do this or how, well, how do no, you do it's this? Actually, it's actually came out of left field. I had cancer in 2012. I had head and neck cancer. Mm. And I had great doctors and, you know, uh, but I had lost my voice for a while. I had radiation for like seven and a half weeks and a uh-huh. light dose of coma came, but, but everything's fine. I'm, I, I lost 60 pounds, but not through the treatments. I did it myself, changing my diet. Yeah. And one thing I learned was that there's uh, uh, antioxidants and a lot of immune uh ingredients in capsaicin that are in hot peppers. And I couldn't find organic ones anywhere. Hmm. You can get them in the store, but they weren't organic or they were outrageously priced. So I started growing a few plants and I would make a hot sauce and I would take it to a radio station in a jar, like with, you know, Sharpie on it that said noggin blast. And they would say, why aren't you selling this? And I went, well, you know, come on. And I did that for two or three years. And then, uh, about two years ago, I decided, okay, and I incorporated. I got all the licensing. Good for you. Yeah, so, it's, yes. it's another it's another art form, you know, because you got to grow it, you got to pick it, and then you. What do you do from there? You you take the pepper off the tree, and then what? Or off the bush, off the pepper I, bush tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, well, I, I freeze them first. Uh huh. Wow. But I'm giving you a secret here. I shouldn't yeah. be telling you this. And then when I defrost them, they're much softer and juicier. 
And then I blend them with whether it's blueberries or tomatoes. I've done mango and peach. Uh, and I cook it uh, and uh, bottle it and <sighs> label it. And uh, and so, uh, yeah, so you I do cook everything. it down and then do the skins dissolve? Does everything oh, dissolve? Oh, no, no. I, the skins kind of just, you know, I, I chop them up first. First I chop them up. I see, yeah. And then uh, I put them in a blender. Yeah. With, with whatever I'm putting, a little garlic and and vinegar. I use very few ingredients. I let the peppers do the talking. I yeah. let the peppers and the fruit do the talking. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Neil Young one time was teaching. It was some crazy thing where I think it was Neil Young had to teach Meryl Streep how to play the guitar or something. It was for a movie <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, it was some crazy thing. And he goes, no, no, you just touch it lightly and let the guitar do the work. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And it's so true, you know, I think it's interesting. All right. So nogginblast.com right on. All right, you guys, we're going to head over to Bruce's story in just a second. But I did want to remind you that we're back at the Hollywood Improv playing story smash storytelling game show. We just had a show October 23rd, but the next show is November 27th. So mark your calendars and head over to storysmashshow.com and you'll always be on top of what's going on. Plus, you can see all the pictures from the show on Instagram at Story Smash. All right, you guys, he's here right now. You've heard him talking, Bruce Baum. He is a comedian and a writer. And yeah, you went to UCLA, got a master's degree in film, and then you become friends with all these people, like you already mentioned, Robin Williams, Bob Saget, Shandling, and you get into the stand-up circuit. Then all of a sudden in 1979 or 1980, you appear on that TV game show, like you said, Make Me Laugh. And then from there, everything takes off. And you did, you know, like you said, the song parodies, Mark, Marty Feldman's Eyes. <laughs> And and then you even did a little bit of acting. You were on Duckard Channing show and also you did some guest roles on Growing Pains, Full House and Northern Exposure. And then what I think is so amazing is that you appeared as an animated version of yourself on The Simpsons. Yeah. And that must have been a dream come true. That validated me with me. <laughs> yeah. And my kids. Honestly. I didn't think I did impress my kids till I did The Simpsons. And that was like, I okay, mean, dad's okay. Honestly. And it lives on forever. I totally uh, raised my daughter on The Simpsons. And. <laughs> We love The Simpsons so much. One time, uh, Pat Oswalt uh, gave me a script from The Simpsons when he was on. And so again, and now, but when he was on, he was playing a character. He wasn't playing himself. Maybe, maybe, maybe since then he has. But anyway, that was a great experience for you. Did you get any of the cells? You know, the, the, uh, the, uh, I'm looking at now. The, the, the animators, animators made me. One that they made because the cells go back to back then. It was Japan or wherever they were going for a while. Yeah. It was years before they came back, so they made me a duplicate that they did, and I have that on the wall. You know, I used to collect animation cells. I still have a couple, but I used to have stuff oh, from Fantasia great. and Snow White. But yeah, oh, yeah, but yeah, to be on The Simpsons was uh, it's a kick. If that's called the Last Temptation of Krusty. Yeah, so. the last temptation of Krusty, which, you know, I'm telling you, The Simpsons is just always so on top of their game. And in that episode is also Bobcat Goldthwait, Stephen Wright, Jay Leno, and Janine Garofalo. So what a laugh. What a laugh. Good on you. And you have been on so many game shows like we talked about. So I'm very excited to hear your story. And you guys can find out more about Bruce Baum over at his website, BruceBaum.com, and also on Instagram at Bruce Baum Comic. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Bruce Baum. Okay. Well, this is when I was doing Super Password, which for those of you who don't know, it's it's you get a word and then you try to get your contestant to say that word using one word clues. And so if the word were house, you might say domicile and hopefully they'll say house or whatever. So it was that show. Now, that was hosted by Burt Convey. Bert Convey, who was a great guy. Wow. He, he passed away from cancer, but he was a wonderful guy. Oh, he was an actor, right? Yes, yes. And we and we hung out even outside the show. I became friends with him, not before we did it, but he was just a really good guy. 
Uh, well, he came off that way. That's for sure. Yeah. And uh, so we're backstage. And for some reason, I remember Steve Allen being there. I don't know if it was he was my foe on the show or whether really he was there hanging out. And I, I got, I've been a Steve Allen. I grew up a Steve Allen fan. And when I was about 11 or 12, we lived a few blocks from him. And my mom said, well, why don't I drive you over there? You can get his autograph. I'm like 12 years old. So she drives me over there. I knock on his door. His housekeeper answers. And I go, is Steve Allen here? I didn't even know if it was the right house, really. And he, he comes out and I say, hi, I'm a big fan. Can I get your autograph? He invites me in. He says, you know, you should never do this. You don't know what kind of man I am. He goes, you know, I, I told him how much I enjoyed his work and blah, blah, blah. But we talked for maybe five or 10 minutes. And then he said, you know, don't be knocking on people's doors. I'm a nice guy. And and he was kind of woven in the fabric of my career. He would all, my first Merv Griffin show, he was on. My first Hollywood Squares, he was on. And I would always kind of recount that s- story to him. Um, so we're backstage and he, he may not, I don't remember him being on the show with me, but I do remember him being there. And the contestant before the show starts says, he's, he tells us he's in the CIA. He says, and he monitors calls from Turkey. Oh, that's cool. And as we get ready and he leaves that little area, we kind of go, well, that's odd. CIA agents usually don't tell you they're CIA agents. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, but maybe we figured maybe because he was, you know, with Steve Allen and, you know, he's, so we get on the show and at the end of Super Password, you, if you're the winner, you can pick one of the celebrities to go to the final round to win. It's $5,000, but every day that somebody doesn't get it, it goes up another 5000 So it's up to 30000 which is pretty wow. big payday back in those. It's good now. So, uh, he picks me. Now, in the, what they did is you had to, for the bonus round, they gave you 10 letters in a row. So if they started at L, it would be L-M-N-O-P-Q-R-S-T-U. So you went through and you knew that whatever word you were trying to get started with that letter. And you had 10. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice um, you know, bonus to yeah. have that letter. And, and uh, you'd. I forget whether it was 30 or 60 seconds. Well, we got through it with time to go out and eat. I mean, this guy, if I, if, if the word were potato and I said window, he said potato. And I mean, he just went through the whole, I was, I've never seen anybody get it that quick. So when the show, so you know, the show's there like six weeks after you tape. And when it was taping, I, I, when it was showing, I was on a show at the time called A Year in the Life. It was one of those first dramedies that had Richard Kiley and Adam Arkin. And, and um, I, I was like the post guy, who sh- postman who showed up every time with a different financial. You got to buy land. The one year old birthday party. I brought a book of financial astuteness, whatever. So I call in the middle. Now, this is before cell phones or, you know, any calling cards and all. So I call home in the middle of the day and ask my wife, has there been any calls? We're on break. She goes, any calls? She goes, it hasn't stopped ringing. ABC, CBS, NBC, all your relatives. Well, the guy that I did the show with, that people recognized him. He was a wanted felon. So all day long, they're showing pictures of me and this guy saying felon, on Super Password, news at five. They don't say who's the felon. <laughs> <laughs> so they go, what had happened was he like took a lot of credit card fraud. He was, he took a, a BMW on a test drive. I think it was like in Nashville and they found it in Alaska. I mean, it was, uh, it was, uh, so, but people know, now he was on the show. He had a cast on his arm and a beard. OK, so they were going through all the, the video seeing is there a hidden microphone there? Because the audience, when they're watching it on the monitors, can see what the word is. But because he had a cast and a beard, it was kind of suspicious. So they couldn't find anything. So they call his mom uh, because uh, now they need to find him and they can't get a hold of him. They call his mom 
and say, uh, is so-and-so there? Or do you know where he is? I have no idea where he is. Well, they have her phone tap. She immediately called him and told him. He immediately called the office at Super Password and said, look, they just transferred me to Alaska to monitor calls from Russia. Can I come in tomorrow and pick up my check? Well, the <laughs> FBI is there and go, yeah, you can come in and pick up the check. So he shows up the next day. And the F- everybody at Goodson Todman who did the show kind of casually dressed, you know. Well, the FBI agents back in those days, you could pick them out of a, you know, a protest. I mean, they were the guys <laughs> with the sunglasses and the suits. So he walks into the office, sees those two guys and takes off. They're chasing him through the building. They eventually find him standing on a toilet seat in a stall in the men's room. And he tried to get out of it saying, you know, I won more than I owe. Can I just pay it off? And they said, well, you're not getting it. You lied on your application. So, wow. yeah, for a day, the world thought I might be a felon. So, uh, Wow. That is so funny. What a knucklehead. He goes on a game show knowing that his face is wanted. Well, he had a beard on, so maybe he figured that would cover it. Oh, so, I see. But, and but, the cast. Yeah, but 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 I guess they started receiving calls right what you know at, while it was airing. Hey, that guy ripped me off here. He left here with that. So, yeah, it was. Do you, uh, how, do you think he cheated in the game show or no? I don't know. He, you know, I've seen the show. I, he got it awful. You know, when you watch game shows, you go, "Well, that guy's good." Whether it's Jeopardy or yeah. Real Afford, you whoa, they know how to play the game. Yeah, yeah. He was, and the fact that he won also, right. you know. So they never found anything. And those were long, probably before the days where you could stick a little microphone in that wouldn't squeal. Yeah, like in other words, yeah, or that somebody's in the audience tipping him off, you know, or there's a mirror on the other side of a camera or he has placed, um, you know, he's placed a mirror in the audience or something, because that's incredible that he was that bright. It was it was like there were some clues because sometimes you need two or three words to get him to say it. You know, sure, of course. There was another course. time when I was on password, uh, and I used a word that actually worked, but nobody in the audience knew what it was. You know, when when you bought pot back when I was in college, it came all seedy and with twigs. You had to bring out an oh, album cover and, yeah. a, and or a shoebox top, shoebox lid, and right. we'll shake it out. And there'd be lots of seeds. And now we know that those were all male plants that were terrible to begin with. Because now when you get pot, they don't want you to have, there's no seeds. So no seeds. So there was actually a word going around then about the time I was doing super password says I haven't heard that much, but it means, but it means seedless without seeds. Right. So the word was, so the word on password was seedless. And the other guy gave a clue. The, his person missed it. Came back to me, and I went, Sensimea. And the guy went, Seedless. And at the break, the producer came over and went, Sensimea? I said, yeah, it means pot that doesn't have seeds. He goes, a little too hip for the room. I went, he got it. (laughs) (laughs) You're too hippie for the room is what you are. That is awesome. Yeah, no, I remember the weed in uh, high school. Like when I said we smoked grass, we were smoking grass. Yeah, yeah. We were just trying to smoke anything because we were so bored. You know, growing up in like kind of rural Pennsylvania, there was just nothing to do. So, you know, that's the I, I don't know. My daughter now is 14 and I find the way to keep her kind of, you know, well, she's just entering teenager hood or whatever. But I feel like if she's busy, when would there be time? Right. You know, because we were just like latchkey kids and, you know, that was it was wide open, you know. So anyway, I love this story. Game show scandal. That is funny as I've, heck, man. I've got another little game show. It's not a scandal with Steve Allen. Like I said, he's a hero. When I grew up, my parents yeah. never had music albums. They all had comedy albums. Oh, everything, great. Every, nice song for you. Everything. but And they were raised, you know, when I was uh, growing up, comedian wasn't a choice. There was like 12 in the United States. You knew who they all were. As a matter of yeah. fact, there was a... Um, every year they do this study about the most depressed uh, occupations. And it's usually dentists lead the lists. 
Yeah, because nobody wants to see them. Right. And they're ticked off. They're not a real, a lot of people don't consider them a real doctor. I do. Right. Just saying. I do, but I don't. I mean, I'm just saying, if I have heart palpitations, I'm not going to the dentist. Well, let me you tell you. Mean? Okay, then let's get down on dentists for a minute. Because all they really have to know is the teeth. They don't even this deal with one the, area. They don't deal with the tongue. If your tongue hurts, you got to yeah. go to somebody else. That's and a different teeth, person. Right. And even the dentist will send you to other. If you got to get a tool, well, let me send you here to get root canal. Wait sure. a minute. You can't do root canal. But anyway, <laughs> uh, or the dentist, that's a different thing. Yeah. And that's improving. I guess I see the ads on TV, how to align your teeth. Cause I was one of those guys who, at night, I had to put on oh, one yeah, of those the headgear yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it was like you were in like a jail, <laughs> right. a jail for your head. <laughs> right. How do we get into dentists? Oh, the most well, we're talking depressing. About, yeah. So Jobs. about two years ago, the the, uh, the list, comedians were the number one depressed. Yeah. And I wrote, that's a good thing. When this thing started, we weren't even on the list. We weren't even considered a profession. Now yeah. there's so many comics. We are a profession. That's a good thing. Yeah, so anyway. that's a good thing. And there's also a lot of comedians like you that even if they didn't do prop comedy, you know, people add music, people add, because if you're a creative person, all this is going to come together. You know, this is what, this is about being creative. Right. Well, the people that are down on prop comedy, I always joke and say, these are the same people that go to a play and go, scenery? What's that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. What is with this scenery? What is this door you speak of? <laughs> that's so really on, funny. I'm doing uh, uh, Hollywood Squares, and I come in one day and I look at because we would shoot five in a day or three one day, two the next, sure. and they would have the schedule up of you know what square you were in. And I show up and I'm I'm the middle square for the five days. And I'm going, wow, how cool. I, I was going, holy Jesus, I can't believe that. So I go back to my dressing room and the doors open a little way and I can see the door where the where the list is on. And I see Steve Allen walk by and do a double take and come back. He knocks on the producer's door, walks in, comes out, new schedule. He's the middle score for four days. I'm at one day. But I was fine with that. I you know, that would be like doing a show with Groucho Marx or somebody and going. So, but anyway, I was telling you, my parents had nothing but comedy albums. So unbeknownst to them, they were kind of raising a comic because they would also, if we were in bed and uh, a comic were on TV, they would yell upstairs, kids, if you're still awake, you can come down and watch the comic and then it's right back to bed. So comedy was kind of a, you know, I had planned on being a lawyer. So it wasn't like I was going to be a comedian. Like I said, there was like Woody Allen, George Carlin, Pryor. When I was growing up, and they were clean back then, you know, before they... So what did you go to UCLA for? I went to UCLA for the first two years. I played football there as a freshman, before freshmen could play varsity. But I wouldn't have made the varsity that year anyway. Yeah. But even <laughs> Bill Walton was on the freshman basketball team. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar couldn't play as a freshman. He had to play. So I knew I wasn't going to be a pro. Uh, so I went up to UC Davis, got my... A Bachelor of Arts in Political Science up there, then came back here and got an MFA in film at UCLA. And I had had no uh, film. I had one film class at UC Davis where I kind of made fun of everybody. Everybody was doing these real esoteric, dragging a chair up a hill for 10 minutes. And <laughs> I, did a, I did a spoof thing that, anyway, I, I went to the head of the, I didn't have any, I didn't have the good enough grades because everybody probably had a 4.0 and has been making films since they were a kid. So I went to the head of the screenwriting department, Professor Menger, because I owe him a lot. I don't think he's alive anymore. Um, but I went in and said, look, I'm not a, I'm a, I am not want to be a screenwriter. And I gave him a copy of a play that my ex-partner and I, Ken Eston, wrote in college called What Are We Doing Here at the University? And he read it and waived all grade requirements and got me admitted into the graduate school. So that's fantastic. It was real. I mean, I, so wow, he must've really believed in you. Well, and then all of my student films, you know, George, no, no, he's not my student films, Robin Williams, Bob Saget, Shandling, Dave Coulier, 
all wow. those guys. Well, we were all hanging out. Nobody was sure. nobody was really known then. Uh, and the fact that I was making films, everybody, you know, wanted to. It's so, interesting. Yeah. 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 And, and the comedy store in Westwood didn't open until like, what, 81, 82? No, that, 80? I'm trying. That had to be open in 75 or 76. Because oh, really? I did play wow. there when Baum and Eston were together and and we split up in 78. So it could have been up to 78. It could mm-hmm. have been 77 or 78. Yeah. But that, that was, there's two rooms I consider the hottest rooms of all time anywhere. The Westwood Comedy Store and the Cleveland Comedy Club. Really? The yeah. Cleveland Comedy that, Club. I now, wonder why. It, it's not there. Well, you know, when it first started, comedy was brand new. You yeah. know, there was no, it, nobody had seen live comedy and yeah. Cleveland make me laugh was huge there. So when you yeah. went, there were people at the airport, when you get to Cleveland, I, I, I'd never seen anything <laughs> like that before. So, wow. That's awesome. Wow. What a, what a brush with fame there, you know, that was a in blast. terms of being like the star, the rock star, you know? Yeah. It was, it was so like that in the eighties. And then it's funny how, when it took a dive and, you know, now it seems like it's coming back. I mean, the comedy store in Los Angeles here is still really strong. Oh yeah. I mean, and then one of the reasons it took a dive, if you remember. The writer's strike and all that, or well, the comedian strike. No, but uh, well, aside from that, there was a time when every TV show had a stand up show. I mean, whether it was Fox or any of the cable, because they're very cheap. So there were people getting spot. You used to have to have a lot of material and be able to chop it in five and six minutes. You know, so you have a number of spots to do if you start to break. Well, because there were so many shows and they had to fill up so much time, guys that only had six to ten minutes were getting their TV spots. But when they went to the clubs, that's all people thought they had that they were going to be that strong for 45 minutes. And after about seven minutes is, well, what do you guys want to talk about now? Oof. So there was a sort of a thinning of the herd of the yeah, bad no clubs kidding. and the comics that were in it for the party and not the art. And yeah. then there was kind of a revival and then the pandemic hit. We'll see what happens now. Yeah, no, that is, it's so interesting because uh, 45 minutes is an awful lot of time. You know, it's an awful lot of time to be on stage. Like, you know, I feel like I have a very solid 12 or 15 minutes, but I started in 92. (laughs) Well, that's a good, you can do opener. I've taken a lot of breaks. No, but you know what I mean? Like, in other words, it's, it's such a craft that has to be worked on diligently day after day after day. And, you know, you just can't, you can't stop. It's such a, um, such a specific art to master. You know, and, and back when we were, I like to say we were dancing in magic because we didn't, nobody was, was big yet. We didn't know what was going to happen, but, um, Every and you think, oh, we're all going to make, we're all going to be comedians the rest of our lives. Well, the industry kind of realized how creative a lot of guys were, and they went off in different directions. Guys that were like acts on the road all of a sudden became writers on a TV show and yeah. went up the ranks to be producers, creators. Other guys went into directing. Guys like Mike Binder, um, and and if you look at television and film a lot of credits are littered with the people who started out at the comedy store and the improv in the seventies and eighties. So I believe that. And even now, because as a stand up, you have some control, you know, whether you do it or you don't do it right. and you can make it happen. You can actually, it's actually tangible as, as, as untangible as it seems, you can just get up where there's a microphone and speak. And the beautiful thing about that is like music, you know, people respond every three to five minutes. And if you're a, a talent agent or A&R from a record company, you can go, I, I'm not really crazy about this music. But if you're in a comedy club and someone's making the place rock every 20 seconds, you can say to yourself, I don't get it, but look oh, at yeah. this. So yeah. with music, it's every three to five minutes. It's, oh, look, they re- everybody else likes it. But when you're being hit with it like this every 20 seconds, yeah. then, yeah, you got to go, well, I need to bring someone else in or we need to yeah. talk to this guy. Yeah, I hear you. I, there's nothing better than laughing, right? 
It's the best. I think uh, it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. And then the applause. I mean, there's just nothing like it. And if you are a comedic person or an artistic person and that grabs you, then uh, nobody can talk you out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's intoxicating. Yeah, it really is. I do a lot of comedy during the day. I go out like I'm going today. I have a spot at one and a spot at two. You know, they're open mics, but, you know, they it's called slotted. They do that a lot now. You might not be familiar because you're not an open micer, obviously. Mm. But anybody that wants stage time, you know, you can. There's plenty of guys that and, and girls, obviously, that have tons of experience that still do open mics, of course. Right. And the way they do it now in I don't think it's just Los Angeles. It's probably everywhere. But, you know, you pay to get on. So it's five bucks for five minutes. Yeah, I'm against that. But Yeah, but how could you be against it? If you if like for me, I have a child I got to pick up at school later. My time is limited. I went to the gym. I'm going to podcast. I'm going to edit. I'm going to hit two, get two spots this afternoon and then come back. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Like get a babysitter? to? No, it's not. It's not you. They shouldn't be charging. Well, yeah, but how how can they keep the lights on? It's not necessarily the clubs. I'm not talking about clubs. I'm talking about places that are for slotted comedy. You know what uh, I mean? Right. Okay. I'm just it's like little coffee shops and stuff. Right. I look. I tell people when they say, "What's the advice you would give someone that's starting or even doing it?" I would say, "Do it as much as you can. Exactly. Wherever you can, do your own stuff, and do what you feel. Don't go outside what you feel comfortable with. And right. so if that's that that certainly was in that sphere. So yeah, no, but it guarantees your stage time. Right. Whereas if you go down to the improv on Tuesday night, there's going to be sixty comics there, and they're only choosing twenty two or twenty five. Right. So I could go to the improv. What am I going to do? Get a babysitter, drive me up, park the car, right, hope right. to get up. I mean, in other words, it's it's just that if you want to be a comedian, then you'll find a way. Right. That's uh, it. I agree. I, I you've changed my mind. If, if Thank that's, you, Bruce if, Baum. If that's the way the system works, and then then <laughs> then you have you have to if you want to be a comedian ride yeah. that train so yes yeah that's the train that's the train that's on the tracks right now <laughs> in fact they even have like these little key like on my keychain there's like even a little a little card like you swipe it <laughs> <I'm not kidding. laughs> it's like you're going to the grocery store you know and you're gonna swipe your thing huh. anyway funny well, stuff a, well good luck with it oh yeah man you know it's uh it's all it's all stage time you know it anyway listen you guys this has been so much fun thank you so much for coming on bruce i really appreciate it thank you for having me yeah it's just awesome you guys can head over to brucebaum.com for more on bruce and you've got a really extensive website all stuff all sorts of stuff going on wonderful website congratulations on that and then also head over to nogginblast.com to check out bruce's peppers who knew you're my first pepper friend Oh, well, I'm your pepper friend. I'm your capsaicin <laughs> pal. And and we will have Christmas packs different pr- oh. that are at, a, at reasonable prices. What a fun gift. That's really fun. You guys can find Bruce over there on Instagram at Bruce Palm Comic. And also, are you on Instagram with the Noggin Blast as well? No, not yet. But I put all my okay. Noggin Blast stuff on there. You okay, know, great. I'll come on right. with little pepper stuff. Perfect. All right, you guys, one more time on behalf of the very talented Bruce Baum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Good. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. You made it. Here. Finally. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of that place you've always wanted to go. 
You know the one. It's nice. Even the kids like it. This place is so cool. And they never like it. Mom, can we go to the pool? Look at that. Not even asking for the Wi-Fi. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. The General Insurance presents Shower Ballads by Shaq. And I'm gonna keep on loving you Cause it's the only thing I wanna do Turns out, everyone does sound better in the shower. And it turns out, The General is a quality insurance company that's been saving people money for nearly 60 years. I just wanna keep on for a great low rate and nearly 60 years of quality coverage, make the right call and go with the General. The General Auto Insurance Services, Inc., an insurance agency, Nashville, Tennessee. Some restrictions apply.